Hello, everyone. Um, good morning, afternoon, evening, depending on where you're joining us today. My name is Abel Andasho, and I'm the program coordinator for the NH Academy and Imana program based at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, thank you very much for joining us on this webinar today, co-hosted by the NH Academy and GIZ about leveraging monitoring and evaluation system for improved SBC. It is the fifth and final webinar in our series on social and behavior change for improved agriculture and nutrition. And you can find uh, all previous webinars in our website. Um, I've got two announcements to make um, from two work streams of the Imana program. So the first announcement that I have is for Imana grants. The call for application for round four of Imana grants is now open and the deadline for submission of concept notes as 21st of January 2021. Uh, the second announcement is from Imana Fellowships. So that's a round six Imana Fellowships for emerging leaders in agriculture, nutrition, and health research is now open for applications. And the deadline for uh, submitting the concept note is 31st of December 2020. Uh, the deadline for the full proposal is 1st of February 2021. I will now invite Osman from GIZ, who leads GIZ's sectoral project, agricultural policy, and food and nutrition for a brief comment and reflection about the whole webinar series. Good morning, good, good evening to everyone, wherever you are, uh, also from my side, and thank you for joining us. So my name is Osman Jibo, as Abel was saying, and I'm leading the sector project on agricultural policy and food and nutrition security at GIZ in Bonn, uh, on behalf of uh, German Federal Ministry of uh, Economic Cooperation and Development. So it has been really a pleasure for us at GIZ to collaborate with uh, Agricultural Nutrition and Health Academy in organizing this webinar series. Starting with the first webinar in July and including today's session, we have all together 12 great speakers from NGOs research, implementing organization, private sector, and social behavior change specialists from all over the world, sharing their valuable and inspiring experiences with changing social behavior for improving agricultural nutrition. So this journey started off with providing an essential understanding of what social and behavior change is and what it is not. So we learn why people do not practice the promoted behaviors and what can motivate them to do so. And how to conduct research to identify the, these barriers and motivators. Building on that, we gain insight on how to use these findings for designing a social behavior change strategy including key message and material uh, that create impact. So at GIZ, supporting social behavior change processes effectively is key to reach our project goals in food and nutrition security and agricultural programs. So during the webinar series, we could gain very rich and very practical insight which can directly use uh, to further develop our approaches. So this requires reflecting on social norms and people's realities, analyzing motivators and barriers and involving the whole social ecological environment. As especially like the statement from Na Ume uh, from Niger, that you need to go to the communities and know their realities, to know their needs and build upon that to elaborate a strategy. So today will be the last session of the series and I'm sure it will be as interesting and inspiring as, as the previous ones. So without further comment, I would like to hand over to Sunita Kadia. Thank you very much. Thanks, Osman. Um, I'll now invite Sunita Kadiela, 
who is the principal investigator for the IMANA program and director of the NH Academy for her remarks. Over to you, Sunita. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Usman, uh, for that inspiring start of, uh, of this session today. Uh, my name is Sunita Kadiala, and as um, Abel said, I'm uh, the principal investigator of Imana. I'm with the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and um, and I'm a nutritionist who work and I work at the intersection, like several of you, I suppose, at the intersection of agriculture, food systems, and nutrition outcomes, uh, focusing on low and middle income countries. And much of my primary work is uh, in South Asia. So uh, you all know what ANH Academy is and what it stands for, but let me just remind you that this is a, a, a network, global network that brings together researchers, practitioners, and policymakers working at the nexus of nutrition and health uh, uh, through improved agriculture and food systems. Now, we are happy to uh, let you know that the Academy is now 4,000 members strong, and we have members from um, 139 countries currently. The Academy offers several opportunities, such as the webinar series that you have, uh, you are, you have been attending and you will attend today, but also the annual interdisciplinary conference, which we call the ANH Academy Week. Um, and we have done five of those and the sixth one is coming up. And uh, we also have what are called working groups where we bring in experts from various, uh, on, on a topic, and, 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 and ask them to think about, help us think about what needs to be done in this field from an interdisciplinary perspective and for either from methods and metrics or theoretical frameworks or programmatic implications. So I invite you all to, if you haven't already done that, to take a look at our working groups and, and the kind of work we are doing. And in the next one or two years, if you are all interested in leading a working group in the future um, and coordinating it, do let us know. Um, we do look for state of the art, you know, um, um, concepts and constructs which we want to take forward or kind of synthesizing what we know on the, and setting an agenda for the next tranche of research on a particular topic. We have several capacity strengthening uh, and training events, including the learning labs, which are the training sessions, which we offer during the academy weeks, but also through uh, the year. I presume and I hope that you're all members of the academy. And if you're not, please do sign up uh, to take advantages of these opportunities, but also feed us back on what, what you would like, um, you would like to be a part of and, and also for us to do. The Academy is one of the work streams of the innovative methods and metrics for agriculture and nutrition actions called the IMANA program. And it is, um, as I said, based from LSHTM, but it is not just an endeavor by LSHTM. We see this as a global uh, public good where we engage with large partner. Large, this is a larger partnerships with several organizations and groups such as the one you're witnessing here today with GIZ. And this has been a wonderful experience. And over the course of the last five months, as Usman said, we have had a fantastic collaboration with GIZ to host this webinar series. And, and we learned certainly quite a lot in terms of what works really well in terms of organizing a webinar series. I hope you have enjoyed this series and you can find all the recordings, as Abel said, uh, and additional resources on our website. And, um, and we also invite you to share these recordings and resources among your colleagues. We don't really, you don't really need any permissions to do that. If you or your organization would like to collaborate with us um, in any particular way, please do let us know. We are an open group, as you know, that we are a super friendly group and, um, and we're always open for suggestions. Um, thank you so much and enjoy the webinar. And thank you once again for, for a fantastic series. Thank you, everyone. My name is Cecilia Gonzalez, and I am a co-leader of the Act to Nude community. Uh, today, we in our last webinar, we will have leveraging m &E systems to improve SDC program performance. And our presenter today, we have two. Leanne Doherty, she's a public health expert with more than 20 years of experience, and she is the senior implementation science advisor for breakthrough research. Her research focuses on informing demand creation strategies and on monitoring and evaluating SBC approaches in Sub-Saharan Africa. We also have Komlan Idan. 
He's an economy statistician and international development specialist with more than 14 years of experience. Comlan has worked as M&E specialist, statistician, data analyst, analyst, and a research associate for health interventions in Togo, Guinea, Burkina Faso, and Cote d'Ivoire and has much experience in evaluation of SBC programs. So without for further ado, I will leave it to our presenters to start the webinar. Thank you for the introduction. Um, Komal and I are really looking forward to sharing some of our experiences with you today. Um, the focus of this presentation will be how we can leverage monitoring and evaluation systems to improve SBC program performance. So I wanted to provide a bit of background on my experience. I currently work as the Senior Implementation Science Advisor for the Breakthrough Research Project, and I'll be pulling examples from my experience with Breakthrough Research, as well as other health projects that I've supported over the years. Breakthrough Research is USAID's flagship social and behavior change research and evaluation project, and we work to catalyze SBC by conducting state-of-the-art research and evaluation and promoting evidence-based solutions to improve health and development programs around the world. Breakthrough Research is led by the Population Council and includes a number of partners who contribute their respective expertise. This five-year project contributes to accelerating the adoption of behaviors that have the highest potential to save lives and fast track sustainable development, such as addressing malnutrition and food security. Breakthrough Research works in close collaboration with Breakthrough Action, its sister project, which is led by the Johns Hopkins University Center for Communication Programs. Um, this unique re relationship allows direct access to state-of-the-art SBC programmatic thinking, capacity strengthening, and knowledge sharing platforms. Before we get started, I wanted to put forward some objectives of what I hope you'll get out of this presentation today. First, I hope you'll, you will understand how to build a project theory of change that incorporates SBC theory. I, next, I hope you will become familiar with how data can be used to prioritize behaviors segment audiences, and select communication channels. I hope you will learn the types of quantitative indicators that are useful to measure in an SBC program, that you're able to explore how routine monitoring and qualitative methods can help tell your story, and finally, that you learn how data can help to explain whether your program reached the desired outcome. So what is an ME system and what does it do? An ME system links strategic information obtained from various data collection systems to decisions that will improve programs. Specifically, an ME system allows you to document pathways with which results will be achieved, monitor process outputs and outcomes for community and donor accountability, and depending on the intent, enables you to determine impact and cost effectiveness to build the evidence base, both nationally and globally. ME is kind of like finance and accounting in that it cannot be done without the close collaboration of program managers and technical experts. A finance manager cannot develop a program budget without understanding the resources required to implement activities. And an M&E officer cannot develop an M&E plan without understanding the planned activities. So I'd like to spend some time discussing the importance of reaching a common understanding among program managers and m and &E officers in terms of what we intend to accomplish and how we will get there. But first, let's take a quick poll to see what we remember from earlier webinars. Um, what types of activities does SBC comprise? Mass media communication, A, B, community engagement, C, interpersonal communication, or D, all of the above? Yeah, so it looks like uh, over 97% have selected the correct answer, which is D, all of the above. Um, and, and there can be additional uh, SBT, SBC related activities as well, but these were just a few examples. So if we're focusing specifically on nutrition programs, program managers may think about designing their activities to focus on different malnutrition determinants, such as those identified in this conceptual framework developed by UNICEF. This framework illustrates causes influencing nutrition and outlines the basic causes, which include the quantity, quality, and control of human, economic, and organizational resources. This may include also political and social systems, as well as the status of women and the underlying causes, which include insufficient knowledge, inadequate practices, and discriminatory attitudes that limit household access to actual resources, which then contribute to insufficient access to food, inadequate caring for mothers and children, and poor environmental hygiene, as well as insufficient access to healthcare. 
and then the immediate causes that contribute to malnutrition and mortality, inadequate food intake and disease. And I wanna highlight a couple of important boxes in this framework. First is the box which highlights the status of women. And the second, which highlights the importance of knowledge, attitudes and practice related to access to food, inadequate caring and hygiene. These determinants are important elements that can be addressed through SBC programs. However, it's important to note that these activities must be contextualized to local situations. Now, we have a basic sense of the types of activities that are needed to address malnutrition and mortality. And we recognize that SBC can be an effective approach to address knowledge, attitudes, as well as social and gender norms influencing these outcomes. And we may begin to identify the activities that will influence these determinants. We might consider organizing these list of activities in a log frame. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with log frames but just as a reminder, a logical framework or log frames is a planning tool consisting of a matrix which provides an overview of a project's goal, activities and anticipated results. It provides a structure to help specify the components of a project and its activities and for relating them to one another. Many m and &E plans use a log frame to list the planned project activities, identify outputs of those activities and list the related outcomes and desired impact. But before we go too far forward in listing our activities, let's revisit something we learned in earlier webinars. For those who are already familiar with SBC or participated in earlier webinars, you will remember that SBC is an evidence-based theory-driven process that identifies factors that influence people's behavior and addresses these by using approaches that are most likely to improve outcomes. This can also include community engagement activities which seek to mobilize groups to share information. And we know from our earlier webinars that there are existing empirically-based theories that have been developed that help us to identify the factors that influence behavior change. There are a couple of examples of individual level SBC, SBC theories. The health belief model first developed by Erwin Rosenstock back in 1974, examines the likelihood of engaging in health promoting behavior. Rosenstock suggests that a few factors influence whether an individual will adopt a health behavior. For example, if the individual perceives that there are benefits to adopting the behavior, that the individual considers that there are threats to their health, if they do not adopt the behavior, and if the person believes that they are capable or have the self-efficacy to adopt the behavior. Rosenstock also suggests that certain cues to action can contribute to the likelihood that an individual will, will adopt a health behavior. Another individual behavior change theory commonly considered is the theory of planned behavior. This theory by Asgen suggests that individuals are more likely to adopt a behavior if they have positive attitudes towards the behavior, believe that others in the community support the behavior or subjective norms, and believe that they have control to adopt this behavior. These determinants then influence an individual's intention to adopt and ultimately behavioral adoption. In addition to individual level behavior change theories, there are also um, community level behavior change theories, such as diffusion of innovations developed by Rogers. And Rogers suggests that there is a core group of innovators that originally adopt a process and that behavioral adoption in a community or society follows a curve where earlier adopters follow the innovators and then the majority of the population followed by the late majority and then finally the laggards. So finally, there are SBC theories that such as the socio-ecological framework that combine levels and look at the individual level, interpersonal or our relationships with partners, families and friends, organizational, community and the enabling environment. So you may be asking, why do we need to spend all this time talking about SBC theories when we just want to monitor and evaluate our SBC activities? Well, these SBC theories can be a very helpful way of identifying behavioral determinants that we need to address when implementing our program and they can be incorporated into theories of change to help us more explicitly map out the missing middle or the change that occurs between what a program does and how it achieves its goals. Take for example, this simple theory of change that integrates aspects of the theory of planned behavior into an SBC approach that is using community developed videos to improve knowledge, attitudes, and self-efficacy related to behavioral practices that address insufficient food and care for children. You can see that the theory of change highlights a key activity, which is that caregivers view and discuss videos. But the theory of change also highlights determinants of the theory of planned behavior, 
including participants gain information on, and are motivated or have a positive attitude to promote or adopt key practices. Participants have the skills and efficacy and access to, to promote or adopt key practices, that perceived sociocultural and gender norms support the practices, and that participants intend to promote or adopt the behavior. By identifying these determinants in our theory of change, we now not only have a common understanding of what activities we are doing, but also how these activities will translate into adoption of key behaviors. Identification of these determinants also highlights opportunities for measurement in our M&E plan, so that we are focused on the ultimate adoption of a behavior, that we are not focused on the ultimate adoption of a behavior, but we are able to have a better understanding of where efforts are still required if we don't quite reach improvement at the end of our project. So now we'll move to data for SBC program design. So we first talked about SBC as a theory-driven process, and now we will talk about SBC as an evidence-based process. It's important to know that evidence drives every aspect of the SBC process, from identifying behaviors, audiences, and channels, to monitoring implementation, and finally to evaluating programmatic impact. And first we should note that there are many forms of evidence we can draw from to inform SBC programs. Literature and desk reviews of existing reports and publications can help provide a better understanding of the context and what has worked in the past. As noted in the previous webinars, qualitative formative research, including Barry analysis, can help to identify areas that need to be addressed. Routine monitoring data can help measure to what extent activities have been implemented as planned and quantitative methods can provide baseline and inline indicators to measure the program effect. Let's talk about the program design phase and how evidence can support behavior prioritization, audience segmentation, and channel selection. I'll provide several examples to illustrate my point. So I know we had a great example of this from an earlier webinar that talked about charting behaviors and the ease of adopting with their potential to improve outcomes. So I'd like to provide another example from some work that Breakthrough Research conducted in Central America related to the Zika epidemic. Program managers recognized that there were many behaviors that could be promoted to address the epidemic. However, it was important not to overburden the target populations. They needed to come up with a way to prioritize behaviors to harmonize across stakeholders. Using evidence on repellent products, the team was able to categorize the efficacy, potential to reduce transmission, and ease of use to reduce the priority behaviors from 30 to 7. So now we have another poll. So please answer um, true or false in the poll. Market segmentation is the process of dividing audiences into groups that share similar characteristics, such as demographic, interest, needs, or location. So sort of overwhelmingly, everyone, everyone got the right answer. It's true. Um, market segmentation um, allows us to divide audiences into groups. So when you think about audience segmentation, you don't need to focus on every audience. You can look at your data and prioritize the audiences who will have the greatest impact on your outcome. For example, say you wanna focus on increasing the percentage of children under the age of six months that are exclusively breastfed. And using data from your baseline survey, you find that younger women with their first child have low levels of knowledge about correct breastfeeding and low levels of self-efficacy, and they're not wildly, widely practicing exclusive breastfeeding. Then you might want to focus your, your SBC approach on teaching the new mom how to breastfeed. You might also see from the data that older women with many children have high levels of knowledge, but low self-efficacy about breastfeeding. So, and they are also not exclusively breastfeeding because they lack the social support, social support to take the time to sit down and focus on their youngest child. In this instance, you might want to focus your approach of a particular intervention on building social, social support for the mother. These are some of the ways that you can use um, data from your baseline surveys looking at both demographic characteristics such as age and parity, and also the behavioral determinants such as knowledge, self-efficacy, and attitudes. Finally, we can use baseline survey data to determine the levels of access to various communication channels. For example, a recent study found that among women of reproductive age in Sokoto, Nigeria, less than 1% read a newspaper once a week, approximately 15% watch TV or access the internet, and about 44% listen to the radio. This suggests that we would be able to reach more women using radio as a communication channel. It also suggests that we likely need to consider more community-based SBC approaches, such as home visits and community meetings to reach women since more than half of the women are not accessing mass media approaches. 
So now my colleague Komal and Eden will share some information on selecting meaningful SBC indicators. I'm very happy to, to be here to share with you some of my thoughts. And I'm happy that uh, Leanne took, uh, took the time to share some of the SBC uh, theory. And we learned that S uh, SBC is an evidence-based uh, process and a theory-driven process also. But how to select meaningful SBC indicator is also an important question. Before we, we begin, let's take a quick poll. So uh, here we are, uh, SBC MNE plan should measure A, the number of the percentage of beneficiary exposed to, to an information for the B, the factor contributing to the behavioral outcome, C, desire behavioral effect on target audience, and D, all above. So let's begin by what are SBC-related indicators. SBC-related indicators measure processes and approaches implemented to motivate and increase uptake and or maintenance of behaviors among intended audiences. Data from SBC-related indicators can be part of a routine monitoring system capturing output level information, or they may come from household surveys and interviews with women and men. And we should note that these surveys which provide SBC data are often based on self-reported answers from respondents and can be subject to social disability biases where study participants respond in a way that they think the interviewer wants them to respond, or they may have struggled with recall bias and cannot remember the exact information. There are some ways you can address these biases by triangulating responses with behavior that you can observe. It is also important that field teams are appropriately trained to not pass judgment in order to avoid biased answers. We discussed how SBC theories can be used to help identify SBC indicators. I would like to take this a step further and provide examples of SBC indicators that measure exposure to interventions, the intermediate level indicator which align with many of the SBC theories, and finally, SBC outcomes. To the left of this image, you see different channels for SBC programming exposure. This includes quality improvement for services, mass media, community mobilization, interpersonal counseling and advocacy. We next see that exposure to SBC programming leads to an intermediate stage. This stage includes skill and knowledge and ideational determinants such as belief, attitudes, norms, self-efficacy, and spousal communication, as well as environmental support and constraint. The intermediate stage then leads to intention and behavioral adoption. So we have three categories of indicators we can choose for the SBC monitoring and evaluation system. First, we look at measuring exposure to SBC programming. This enables us to understand the extent to which beneficiaries are exposed to SBC approaches. We can see here some examples of indicators that measure recall of SBC messages. For example, percentage of women that have heard messages about hand washing by tip of messages in the two weeks preceding survey. This shows the percentage of women who have heard a particular message promoted by the SBC project. Using data from a baseline, midline, and endline survey, we can see how recall of key messages increases over time. The second half of the table shows percentage of women 
who heard messages on hand washing by canal in the two weeks preceding survey. This shows which canal was most frequently mentioned. This particular intervention focused primarily on video based messages. So you can see that it was zero at baseline but increased at the second survey and at end line to over 50 percent secondly we consider measurement of sbc intermediate outcomes and by this we mean indicators that enable us to evaluate and understand the factor that are contributing to behavioral outcome actually there are not measuring behaviors but factor or element that are contributing to it using ideational indicators we are able to see high levels of knowledge and positive attitudes toward hand washing through implementation however at baseline there are low levels of self-efficacy you can see at point three and low hand washing behaviors at point four following exposure to the intervention which aims to provide women with spousal support to manage hand watching stations self-efficacy and behavioral adoption improve for the self-efficacy we see the percentage of women who could who could definitely have or install a hand watching station the, this percentage moved from 35 percent at baseline to more than 83 percent at end line for the point four we can see the percentage of a household with at least one place designated to wash hands moving from 14 percent at baseline to 59 percent at end line third we consider sbc outcome this enables us to determine if the behavior has changed or if there is an intention to that some examples include proportion of children from zero to five months who were exclusively breastfeed in the 24 hours preceding the survey or proportion of, of children from six to nine months who received complementary feeding in the 24 hours preceding the survey these indicators are related to the measurement of nutrition behavior and percentage of households using improved sanitation facilities this indicator is related to each Asian behavior in the household. There are a number of, of, uh, of potential agriculture, food security, and uh, nutrition and wash related behavioral indicators available through the website Indikit. Indikit is a great resource that provides very practical guidance on the use of hundreds of the most commonly used process output outcome and impact indicators across different sectors. The website also provides step-by-step -step guidance on how to collect and analyze data for many indicators related to the main focus of this webinar. So I want you to remember that it is important to select all of these three category of indicator in, a, in order to have a better SBC monitoring and evaluation system. What we have seen so far is most of the program focus on exposure indicator. Now I will pass the microphone back to Lynn who will explain the monitoring of SBC implementation. Great. Now let's take our last poll. True or false? Focus group discussions and in-depth interviews are only useful to inform project design before implementation. Great, we have about 50% responding and the vast majority of you have responded with the correct answer, which is false. We will get to discuss soon why qualitative methods like focus groups and in-depth interviews can be a really valuable tool to help you understand how and why your program activities are working. So as we continue with discussing monitoring SBC implementation, we recognize that measurement is a tool to strengthen SBC programmatic focus and determine effectiveness and programmatic impact. So let's focus a bit now on how measurement can be used to strengthen SBC programmatic focus during implementation. So you have established your theory of change. You've selected your priority behaviors, audiences, and channels. 
You have identified the activities that are being implemented along with the indicators on programmatic exposure and intermediate and outcome level indicators. And your program is underway and you don't wanna wait until the very end to find out that your activities were unsuccessful and the behaviors haven't changed. So you can start to ask them important questions to help you understand how things are going. These questions include, how well did the planned activities adhere to the original design of the project during implementation? How have contextual factors influenced the intervention? And have planned activities influenced the proposed change pathways in the theory of change? So when you aim to answer the questions, how well did planned activities adhere to the original design of the project during implementation, you can leverage your routine monitoring systems. And by this I mean the output level indicators that capture if you have completed the activities that you plan to complete compared to your target. So for example, your project may have planned to conduct community meetings to share information with community members. And as you can see in this example, this project met their targets in Q4 of 2013 and Q1 of 2014 and outperformed in Q2, quarter two, and quarter three, but then nothing happened in the last quarter 2014. So you find yourself asking why, what happened? You can then begin to bring in other data sources such as qualitative information to help you understand what is happening. You can conduct focus group discussions and in-depth interviews with project staff, government stakeholders, and beneficiaries and communities to understand better what other factors are influencing the ability of their project to adhere to the planned activities. In the example of the project where they missed the community meeting targets in the last quarter, we were able to determine through interviews that this was a result of some contextual factors occurring at the community level. First, the farming season occurred and fewer men and women were able to attend program activities because they were in the field. And then, due to a poor farming yield, annual migration occurred at the end of the farming season and it was difficult to mobilize key audiences because they were away. We can also use qualitative methods to understand how or why the, the planned activities are influencing behaviors outlined in the theory of change. You can conduct interviews to assess reasons why some people are not adopting the promoted behaviors and then use this to develop interim recommendations that provide suggestions for frontline workers or peer educators on how to improve. I provide, provide an example here of a quote and it says, yes, it is the peer volunteers and those people who came and showed us the video that advise us to breastfeed our babies. They said we should always handle the baby in such a way that they feel comfortable to breastfeed by either using our right or left hand to support the bottom of the baby while she breastfeeds. They also told us that the two breasts contain different content. One has the breast milk serving the purpose of water, while the other one serves food to the baby, and so we should always make sure that we breastfeed the baby both breasts instead of limiting them to one breast. So you can see here that there are some messages that need to be corrected that are being shared by peer educators, and so this provides an opportunity to address this during implementation. Now we will transition to a discussion on determining if the SVC program reached the desired outcome. So first we focused on how measurement can be used to strengthen SBC programmatic focus during implementation. Now let's consider how it can be used to determine effectiveness and programmatic impact. So now you're nearing the end of your program and you wanna know if you reach the desired outcome. Some questions you may wanna ask are, to what extent did the project address the main barriers? To what extent did the project achieve the desired behavior change and was it cost effective? And third, to what extent are the changes likely to last? So if you've included some of the ideational measures that we discussed in your baseline and inline survey, you can begin to see if the project was successful in addressing some of the barriers to behaviors. In this example, we use the health belief model to understand that the likelihood that a mother will take her child for vaccination. You can see we measured several of these determinants, including cues to action, knowledge about the health behavior, perceives that there are threats to the health if they do not adopt the behavior, attention to adopt the behavior. And you can see how the cues to action increased in the intervention group when compared to a comparison group. And you can also see how there were more gains related to a mother's knowledge and mothers believing that if their child was not vaccinated, they would be more likely to get sick, suggesting the project was making some progress in changing behaviors as evidenced also by the increasing intention. 
And this is really helpful because we see that changes, that the change is following the proposed pathway. And if the duration of the intervention continues, we may see greater improvements in the ultimate outcome of vaccination rates. There are a number of different study methodologies, each with their strengths and weaknesses. But baseline and inline surveys, particularly with a comparison group, can be an important tool to determine if your project achieved the desired behavior change. In this example, we looked at whether the house had a hand washing station and whether proper hand washing was observed. The first four bars are for whether the house had a hand washing station, and the comparison group saw a very small change between baseline and inline, while the changes in the intervention group were slightly higher. In the last four bars, you see that proper hand washing only changed about five percentage points in the comparison group, while the intervention group this increased by 17 percentage points. This is helpful in telling the story of whether your program achieved the desired behavior change. Another example where you can illustrate how surveys can help to answer the question, are the changes likely to, to last? Here you see in the bar chart that at the beginning of the project, women were responsible for maintaining a hand washing station. However, after the intervention, which aimed at increasing male involvement in household tasks, the proportion of men and women maintaining the hand washing station was equal. However, we went back a year after the intervention concluded and the men were no longer maintaining the hand washing station at the same levels, and the women were again maintaining the hand washing station, and the behaviors were not sustained. So finally, once you've learned all of these great lessons from your monitoring and evaluation, be sure to share your experiences. You can organize in-depth technical workshops, technical workshops with team members to discuss emerging findings. You can provide donors and policymakers with evidence on what works for addressing a given problem, where the gaps are, and what actions they should consider addressing. You can discuss evaluation findings with beneficiaries, seeking their feedback on the validity and accuracy of the findings. You can also publish your research results for broader sharing and share through online platforms. And so finally, I want to leave you with a, a few recommendations um, to conclude our presentation. Um, first, programs should use a theory of change process at the design stage to identify important behavioral drivers that can be addressed with SBC programs. You should leverage baseline data to not only provide baseline indicator values, but to inform behavior prioritization, audience segmentation, and channel selection. When selecting indicators for m &E plans, consider measures that assess programmatic exposure and behavioral de determinants, and not just the final outcomes. Introduce qualitative studies throughout implementation in order to complement routine monitoring and help explain how your program is working. And finally, don't forget to share evidence on what works and how the interventions can be improved to advance the field and achieve greater programmatic impact. Thank you. I'd like to start with um, a question from me. Um, I would love to hear from both of you about uh, in terms of like the process timeline for the m and &E, uh, of an SBC intervention. How does it look like uh, from design to implementation? Uh, can you give like a specific example of a project that you have worked on? I think several of the projects that I've worked on have been about um, between two and three years. Uh, so maybe the first six months or so would be in pulling together this baseline information, informative research, and building the theory of change, um, and then having a couple of years for implementation, um, followed by the inline. Um, during implementation, there in these projects, there's been a couple of rounds of qualitative data collection that's um, complemented monthly routine monitoring, and we were able to work um, closely with the implementing partners to um, hold sort of biannual um, workshops and meetings to talk about the findings and feed that back into the program. I have worked also with uh, a project uh, for, um, for three or four years or something like that because our project is uh, more uh, about, uh, you know, the process, it depends on uh, what kind of, uh, what is your, like your target audience and what kind of behavior you want to, to change. You know, there, there are some behavior that are taking more longer time. So when you design a, a monitoring and, uh, and evaluation system at the, at the beginning of, of the project, you have also to uh, set the system that is able to collect the data throughout the, 
the process, but also to be able also to give time to your indicator to uh, to to change or something like that. You will give the time to measure all of this uh, this indicator. So I your question about the timing about uh, how to design the M&E uh, system. I think uh, it depends on the kind of, uh, of program you have. So uh, when I'm working on a, a program that is changing uh, uh, how a woman uh, uh, like uh, breastfeeding the, the kid, the, like the, the systematic breastfeed or something like that, and how like all of this uh, uh, nutrition will uh, impact the, the kid uh, of a uh, the baby's health and how all of this will impact the the mortality or uh, uh, some health uh, health indicator. You know, you know, you need some time to from the exposure until the outcome and the behavior to change. So, for example, for, for the mortality, the mortality will take more time to change. So it depends on your 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 project. But in terms of designing the many project you are, you are, you, are, you will be designing it at the beginning of the, of your project and uh, i think i don't know if i i i, I give a clear answer to your, your your question um so we have a question from mary jo hold uh she asks is or is social behavior change approach a mixed method approach which is robust I think a mixed approach in terms of data data collection. Uh, I, uh, we 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 recommend a mixed approach. It uh, it's true that it is uh, expensive, but it is the best way to collect a, a reliable and a very uh, very good data. Because a quantitative approach alone is not is not sufficient to understand all of this. Uh, Ideational factors. You know, there are some additional factors we need to understand. For example, a social norm. We need to understand why a woman uh, like uh, prefer to to give water to the to the uh, to the newborn. You know, there is there are some cultural factors that are associated to this, and uh, the quantitative indicator is not enough. To understand or to uh, to like to evaluate this kind of uh, this kind of behavior, so we need the mixed approach method so that to complement and to have a better understanding of uh, the factor that are contributing to our behavior. You mentioned uh, just now the idea of ideational factor. We have a question for clarification on that from Muhammad Abubakar. What does ideational indicator mean? So when we talk about ideational indicators, um, we also sometimes call them behavioral determinants. We're talking about the indicators um, uh, in, in the slides that Coleman was sharing, the middle part, which pulls from some of these SBC theories. So we mean um, question, uh, indicators related to social norms, um, attitudes, self-efficacy. Um, sometimes it's related to um, gender and, and um, spousal communication or partner communication. So those are the, the intermediate or ideational type indicators that we're referring to. Olivia Hardigan asks, do you recommend ever using focus group discussions to collect, oh wait, no, I think you already answered that on the chat too, but I'll complete it, Con to collect quantitative data at the same time as qualitative data. Yes, you can definitely um, collect them at, at the same time. You know, say if you're doing your inline survey, you can also be collecting some qualitative information, and and use that to sort of triangulate the findings that that you're um, you're getting from the qualitative data. So you can okay. you can collect it at the beginning, middle, and end. Uh, you know, when you are uh, you are doing a focus group, you are getting some uh, some data. But this data, you cannot use it as a, quanti a quantitative data because the quantitative mm -hmm. data, the, uh, the data a collection process uh, use, for example, sampling methods, represent uh, representativeness, and so on. So we cannot like go collect a focus group data and take this data as a quantitative, a quantitative data. 
So there, there is a, a, a specific process to collect a quantitative data. There is a question here from Florence Secula. Uh, she asks, uh, the literature often mentions an intention behavior gap. How can an m &E framework unpack the black box between intention and impact? Uh, you know, the, the impact is, as a, is a seen as a, a long-term effect, you know? Uh, when you, 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 you have a, an intention, you have to realize this uh, uh, this intention, and this intention will uh, will change uh, something uh, in the long run. You know, so I can see the intention is will be like more kind of short term effect, and uh, the behavior that uh, is caused by the intention will be the like the the, the long term effect. I don't know if uh, Leanne agree with me. This is again a, a point where, um, you know, you, when you analyze some of these um, ideational indicators, um, you you can include them in sort of a regression model to see how how they predict. So there may be some interaction also, um, you know, between uh, some of the other components like self-efficacy that are that are influencing um, intention. So that might be one, another way to sort of unpack that. And, and of course, also um, looking at some of these qualitative methods to ask as well. We have some questions that I believe are specifically about some of the examples that you, you gave. So I'll ask these two together. Guy Sharon asks, did you include monitoring indicators on number of sessions made prior to any behavior change observed? And Simone Wichler asks, you concluded that after one year, the behaviors had not been maintained. Did you analyze why this was and what could be changed in the project? Yeah, so part of the, the monitoring activities included tracking on a monthly basis um, these types of sessions um, before the, the, the final um, I mean, we used a, a survey to be able to tell at the end line whether the behaviors had changed. So we were tracking on a monthly basis. Um, and then with regard to the question on, um, you know, did we understand why the, the changes with the male involvement in the hand washing station? Unfortunately, because we, we didn't do qualitative um, the, a year following the implementation, we just did a, a sort of another survey round. We weren't able to actually explain um, why that had changed. What tips should be, should be considered to make sure we are leading to desired behavior change at process and output, output level, probably during the monitoring? You know, usually these types of indicators might be related to um, the number of participants attending um, a, a, a community meeting or the number of house visits um, that a peer educator is making. And so um, these process indicators are, are part of the pathway of um, getting to the desired behavior change. And so they can give you evidence on um, how well you're, you're sort of maintaining fidelity to your to your project design. Um, and, and that's sort of why we also encourage for these other indicators and, and methods um, to sort of be able to explain a bit more how and why, but it can, it can really help to explain um, sort of uh, your fidelity to the, to the planned activities. I, I, just, I just want to add that uh, it is important to consider the uh, logical framework. You know, when we, have, uh, we are targeting a specific uh, behavior, it's, it is important to build, to take the time to build this uh, kind of a specific uh, logic uh, framework, with, which will uh, show all of the, the, the factors that are contributing to the, the behavior change. So when we we have all of these factors, and also we have indicator that is uh, like uh, helping us to measure all of this uh, factor, we can uh, try to uh, to, to set a time to measure all of this, uh, this indicator by the time and to see how uh, these indicators are moving and how the movement can contribute to the behavior change. So uh, most of the project, we don't have the, uh, the midterm uh, mid evaluation. I think, I think the midterm uh, mid evaluation is very, very important 
because it shows us how we are we are moving to our goal. And this midterm uh, midterm evaluation, I think, but uh, program should uh, incorporate it to a to a budget because it is very very useful and uh, help people to to see if they, they they have something to change. They have to, they have to change the strategy and and so on. We we do have um, a raised hand uh, from Imgan Jordan. Um, yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm wondering about an indicator list um, to monitor actually what is happening outside your own specific um, project, which may influence on the negative or positive part um, the activities you are doing on whether you can recommend certain indicators where you have good experience, because I think the whole set of indicators in the M&E system is already very complex and you may have a lot. Um, and it's very hard for projects to then um, come up with like bigger, smaller or large, huge projects to where, where they have a low budget and to decide on the most important ones. In addition, I was wondering on whether you have some experiences on which indicators might be appropriate for um, the social mobilization for the social mobilization process or for those who are doing any community trainings on their qualification uh, because from our observations they actually can crash a program if they don't do it correctly and vice versa so you may have a very good program and very good materials but the staff itself may not be able to actually um, um, work together with the communities Thanks. Um, these are great questions. I can speak a little bit. Um, you know, I think in particular nutrition and agriculture programs are, are, are very complex. And so setting out that theory of change and sort of acknowledging, um, you know, both your, your pathways and how you get to your outcomes, but also these, um, these other um, contextual factors that may influence your program, but are not directly in your, in your plan path are really important to outline. Um, and, and, you know, these are, you're already collecting quite a bit of information. So adding additional layers like this um, can be challenging. Um, one way that we're kind of addressing this complexity, we're doing an evaluation um, of a, a food security and agriculture project in and health project in Niger is we're um, bringing in other data sources to help complement and help to sort of tell the story. So, um, you know, one of the one of the issues we're looking at nutrition, but we want to understand sort of climate and how that's also um, affecting the outcomes. And so we're layering in some um, some climate related data on on um, precipitation uh, over the implementation period, and that you can get from secondary sources. Um, you know, as long as you have the the, the GPS coordinates to layer in. Um, so we're we're able to address that. Um, and then there's also another um, uh, evaluator who's looking at a different aspect of the program that's more geared towards um, the economic side and, and resiliency. And so we're also sort of coordinating with them to be able to pull in some of their data to help explain maybe some of these contextual factors that we won't have in our in our data collection systems. So um, I guess like the short answer is to say that we'll sort of look for other sources and see how you can triangulate in. Um, and then your second question was about um, indicator, indicators for social mobiliza mobilization process, and um, and I totally uh, understand what you're what you're talking about here in terms of. I mean, I think that's a bit our example of how, you know, we had peer educators that were supposed to be um, educating women about how to correctly breastfeed, and they kind of um, went rogue on us a little bit and <laughs> started um, adding in some other ideas that had not been part of the original training. And so that's, you know, having um, either direct observation or, um, you know, talking back to the beneficiaries to find out their perspective can kind of help you to um, identify some of these red flags and, and be able to go back and make some corrections before the end of the, the project. We have Tofik Dapila, who is uh, also wanting to ask a question. My question has to do with how most of the time projects are kind of fixed right from the open call stages. You know, um, you kind of put in place the strategies that you think um, is going to help you to be able to implement the program, your TOCs and everything like that. And then after you win the project, it is kind of sometimes very strict and difficult for you to make changes. But as monitoring evaluation people, we understand that 
these might be our ideas of how we think the project can be implemented. But maybe during the baseline or um, during community engagements, having a focus group, you try to kind of find out their ways or what they, are, what they also think that it is their barrier that is preventing them from maybe being able to put, uh, implement a particular um, um, behavior. So for example, when we talk about how what should we soak, and then um, our strategy, for example, is to kind of um, engage the people, educate them on the importance of washing their hands with soap and the effects, the uh, good effects that it can help prevent diarrhea and other diseases and all that, and they buy into that. But one of the key things is that it's very difficult for them to get access to soap, even if they have the water to buy, the, the, the money to buy the soap in the community. So in such cases, it makes it very difficult for our knowledge that we've had or the data that we have to be able to speak to improving the program or making changes to the program, which the donor has already kind of agreed that we choose that these are the activities that you are going to be doing. So making changes to the um, 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 activities that you've already agreed with the donor might mean less money or more money. And that makes it very difficult for us to kind of make those changes. I don't know what are some of the ideas or some of the ways um, 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 going forward we can kind of um, we can do to kind of um, accommodate these, some of these things. Uh, you know, for this, if I, I understand your your question clearly, you uh, you design a kind of uh, some uh, some activities, and uh, you are you are seeing that the activities are not working, and you want to change, right? So I I think that uh, you know uh, sometimes the uh, the uh, the assessment we, we 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 can we can conduct at the beginning of, uh, of our project, the assessment are not sometimes very uh, very accurate because we are we are on a rush and we don't take time because we have uh, a deadline to to fulfill and, and so on. So uh, my uh, my experience is that I I have I, I was in a project where. The, some of uh, the activity are not uh, working, and uh, you know the, 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 the good thing is to discuss to, di to discuss all of this with the the, the, the project uh, the manager, and the project uh, manager I think he will he will understand that where we are going, we not like we not uh, fulfill or we not reach our goal. So if the the manager understand all of this. There is a, a possibility to like uh, to redesign the the, the project uh, to, uh, to to make some change. You know, it will not be all of the project that will change, but some specific aspect will, will change. I think this is uh, I have this kind of this is my my thoughts. I don't know really the, your your specific uh, a, a context, but I think that you you should uh, discuss with the project uh, manager. And you you can make some change, some specific change where you think that the change are very uh, relevant, because where you are going, you are going to like to nowhere because you you know that your activity you are doing will not give the result you are, you are expecting. You know I, that is that is definitely a challenge. You 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 have your proposal, you start with your project, and then you realize maybe that you're not reaching, you know, the change that you had had desired, and you need to to adapt your process. I think something that's um, sort of gained traction in the last few years is this idea of, um, of adaptive management and, um, and, and something that um, if you have the opportunity to introduce with, with donors or, or project management is this idea that, <clears throat> that you, you can begin your implementation but you use this data um, throughout your project to sort of um, adapt and change as you as you need to to um, to reach your your desired outcomes, um, and and hope that that you have the opportunity to do that. Um, and and we could provide some resources on this sort of concept of adaptive management if if that's helpful too. Yeah, I like how you mentioned at the beginning that you know it's both like the theory driven and in the evidence driven throughout the process. I think that's a good question topic for uh, really all, all of the programs, not just the FBC. I have a last question too that I wanted to ask from the chat box and that I thought was a good question 
um, to end with David Strife, Strief, um, asks, who is the most important actor in SBC theory? The first innovators, the first followers of the innovators, or the early mass? And what does this mean for the m &E system in terms of timing? I know in some SBC approaches that, that try to address um, this sort of idea of diffusion of innovation, there's a um, like change management type um, uh, intervention or approach where you 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 start. Um, I can I can I haven't used this, but I can provide an example of, of an experience I've had where um, maybe you're trying to introduce a new type of technology into the workplace. And so you identify who are these early adopters or innovators within your organization, um, and you train them first on the technology that you're trying to introduce. Um, and then they become sort of like a node in a network of um, diffusing that, that experience onto people that they're connected to at the organization. And that allows it to sort of um, expand out over time. Um, so that that could be sort of one way of looking at it. So it's not that there's necessarily one that's more important than the other, although, you know, making sure that you um, that you have like a core group that can sort of um, network out to share the information um, and provide the um, the resource or the knowledge to expand as useful. Well, we have only a couple of minutes, so I think we'll just wrap up with that. I don't know if uh, Komla, you have any last words um, before we end. I think this is a good, uh, good opportunity to, to, to share with thought and to learn, eh, to learn from, from you. You know, uh, we are in a community, we want to do our best to make change uh, in, uh, in people's lives. So sharing uh, our knowledge, sharing some, uh, some information is a very, very good thing to do. So I want to, to, to say thank you and to congratulate all the organizers. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who has participated in all these uh, webinars. It has been a pleasure to, to be part of it. We really appreciate you all. Thank you so much.